according to Luke this morning. Our reading comes from the ninth chapter of Luke, starting with verse 51. And I'll be sharing this morning from the New Revised Standard Version. If you brought a Bible with you and your translation is a little different from mine, that is all right. I am not reading Luke's Greek. You don't want me to read Luke's Greek. It will not be pretty. But somewhere in between the words on your page and the words on mine, there is a word that God will speak to us together. A reading from Luke. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, First, Lord, let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Friends, he with the Spirit is saying to God's people. You may be seated. Let the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This may be one of those stories that I would generally avoid given the, the option. It's tough. It's a little weird to hear Jesus turning on people in, in the way that, that he seems to let the dead bury their own dead. Or no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Well, that reminds me actually of a, a couple moments that I had helping to resource kayak camp a couple afternoons this past week. Our kayakers were in flat bottom boats. These are whitewater kayaks. Flatwater kayaks have keels. What do keels do on a boat? Yeah, they help it go straight. It's like a fin on the bottom of the boat. And so it, it keeps the water going in one direction, keeps your boat straight. Whitewater boats don't have those because they're not designed to go straight. Whitewater doesn't go straight. River water goes wherever the river goes. It meanders and it goes around rocks. And sometimes you want to go around a rock and you want to follow the current. And so we had to teach the kids how to paddle in a straight line, which involves your line of sight. If you have an obstruction coming up in the river and you look at it, guess what you're going to go toward? You're going to go right toward that obstruction. Look, a big rock. I don't want to hit that. So you look to the side. Some of us learned this, this lesson when we learned to drive a car. But Jesus, of course, is talking to, uh, to people who, who predate cars. You don't gawk at the accident on the side of the road because you're going to meander. You don't turn and look back when you're plowing because the plow is going to turn with you. I don't know. It's a story full of weird stuff, even as short as it is. But I don't know. For, for just pure dramatic value, today's Old Testament reading, I think, has it beat. And it's a bit, a bit longer, but it's, it's attention-getting. 
us is from the beginning of Seton Kings. Now, when the Lord is about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, how many of y'all know this story? When the Lord is about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha, to confuse things, were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. For the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they were both standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Got it? There's a lot happening in that little story. It's, it's the passing of the, the prophetic mantle, which I believe is only attested to here. It's a passing of power from Elijah to Elisha, although Elisha's name is not the one that makes it through the centuries. It's the reflection of the passing of the Hebrew people through the Red Sea or the Reedy Sea, which again reflects the passing on of prophetic power and draws that line way back to Moses. And it's also a glimpse into the relationship between Elijah and Elisha, who cries out in grief when Elijah is taken up and the word that's ripped from his mouth, the thing that he calls Elijah isn't teacher, it's not master. What is it? Father. The same word that Jesus uses, which I think falls a lot easier from the mouth than father, which is a trippy kind of clumsy word. Father. Abba, Abba. Now there's more to it. It's, it's a rich story that gives us perspective on a lot of things. But when we put this story beside the gospel story today, there's one thing that jumps out at me. Determination. Do you see it? It's named in no uncertain terms in the gospel, especially in, in some other translations. Jesus determined to go to Jerusalem. But it's evident in Elijah's story, too. Elijah knows what's going to happen. He knows there's no way around it. He knows what he has to do, and so he steals his... Fit. And that might not be the right phrase to use because in that region at this time, steel isn't a thing yet. Whatever, it's fine. He steals his face and heads to 
his end. And I wonder how much he knows. I wonder if he knows how this taking him away is going to happen because I'm not sure I'd be afraid of ending my earthly days as much as I'd be afraid of riding a chariot of fire and horses of fire into a tornado. Ugh. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love roller coasters and I love whitewater kayaking and climbing on rocks, all that adrenaline boosting stuff, but this is a bit much. Elijah knows, at least to some degree, what's coming, and he faces it with determination. Elisha won't turn him back, and he won't be turned back himself either. But Luke says that Jesus does the same thing. That 51st verse is a turning point in Luke's gospel. The tone changes as Jesus' direction changes. Everything from this point to the cross is a march toward Jesus' passion and death. And it's worth pointing out, I think, that Jesus isn't skipping and whistling his way to Jerusalem. I mean, y'all, we talk of, of death sometimes as though there's nothing to fear, nothing that ought to make us nervous. We, we face grief and death focusing on the glory that follows. Just think about what's to come. Think about golden streets and, and, and angel harps. But y'all, death is scary. Death is painful. Death is real. We have to go through it. Jesus knows that. And it shapes the tone of his ministry from this point on. I don't think we do ourselves any favors glossing over the realities of death. Jesus knows what's coming, and he sets his face for it. He becomes determined. Now, nobody around him understands. When they make their way through Samaritan cities, the residents reject them. They don't understand what Jesus is about to do for them on their behalf. They only understand that he's on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, the holy city of the people who rejected them. That's not their holy place. That's the holy place of the holier than thou's. He's one of those too good for us Hebrews. Forget him. And other people come to him to be part of his, his in crowd, but they don't understand the depth of commitment that's about to be required. It's, it's going to be more than they can handle. Even his closest friends, the very most dedicated, will all fall away eventually. It's too much. But Jesus is determined. Sometimes we have to be determined in order to focus on the task at hand. Sometimes we have to set our face to keep our eyes on the goal or we'll never make it there. It's too hard. Too scary. Too awful. It's too much. It's too intense. But stay on target. It may not get less scary. It may get threatening. It may get desperate. Even folks who you thought were friends and allies may at least seem to fall away. Stay on target. Keep that goal in your sights. And... Pay attention. Even on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus and his crew took the time to offer healing and hope and forgiveness. They may have seemed like distractions at the time, but, you know, as John Lennon reminds us, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. And, you know, some of us 
are called to precise and focused advocacy. Some of us are called to vocations of mercy. Some of us are called to some other type of specific kind of ministry. Cool. That's great. But some of us are also called just to be. And for that, Paul offers a means of focusing today. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only don't let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge your selfish impulses, but serve each other through love. Focus on love. Focus on the things that are loving. Focus on the things that Paul describes as fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Because there will be plenty that distracts us from that task. We see it all the time in our politics and in our communities and in our churches. With our fragile little human egos, we find ourselves hurt by something that somebody else does, whether it's intentional or it's unintentional, aggressive or neglectful. And in response, we just want to lash out. We want to bite and devour, but don't do it. If you bite and devour each other, you bite and devour the body of which you are a part. And it won't be like biting your nails off. It'll be like ripping chunks out of your belly or out of your legs. Paul says the actions that are produced by selfish motives are obvious. Since they include sexual immorality, moral corruption, doing whatever feels good, idolatry, drug use and casting spells, hate, fighting, obsession, losing your temper, competitive opposition, conflict, selfishness, group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, partying, and other things like that. I warn you, as I have already warned you, that those who do these kind of things won't inherit God's kingdom. You people outside the church see us biting and devouring each other with hate and fighting and rivalry, and they know better. They see it. They're not fooled by our facade. Stop with the gossip. Stop. Stop with the fighting. Stop. Any determination to outdo someone else, to damage their reputation, to under, undermine the, the work they're trying to do is destroying the body. Focus on grace. Focus on forgiveness. Focus on building up the body. As Dr. King reminded us, stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. Be determined to love. Be determined to make every action and every word blossom with the love of Jesus that, that expects much and forgives all. Whatever you're calling, whatever your focus, be determined to love. And then God, through you, will turn this world around and bring all God's people together in one glorious family. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.